Did you know that filming Dune Part 1 was so gruelling that safety precautions were brought in to avoid a meltdown? Find out why later, and at the end we'll be discovering which of the actors' stomachs made filming uncomfortable for their co-star. But first, Fact 1, one of the stars was terrified on set. The Baron is an imposing character. To get his rhino-like features ready for the movie, Stellan Skarsgård needed to immerse himself into the role in more ways than one. More on that later. But he was so convincing, David Dasmalkian, who plays Peter de Vries, was horrified when he saw Skarsgård for the first time on set. It doesn't help that this scene was in his steam room where he got to see the Baron in all his glory. But despite Skarsgård looking like the kind of person you definitely don't want to see in a sauna, it was actually the performance that chilled Dasmalkian the most, in particular his eyes and voice. That's not to take away from the unbelievable transformation that the Swedish actor went through. After all, he wouldn't be happy if all that work was for nothing. Fact 2. Skarsgård went through a grueling transformation Stellan Skarsgård is a fantastic actor but he spent 30% of his time on the movie sitting there doing nothing. This is because the work needed to turn him into the grotesque Baron took 80 hours. This broke down into 8 hours a day, which in the actor's own words was painful but worth it. He was insistent they went through this effort rather than using CGI dots on his face. When the work was done, despite what Das Malchian thought, the Baron actor thought the costume did all the work for him and the acting part was a breeze after that. I think he's just being modest. This isn't the first time he's gone through an ordeal to look the part for a movie. In Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Man's Chest to become Bootstrap Bill, he also needed to make friends with the makeup team. But this time, it was only for four hours a day. Back to June now, and it wasn't just the transformation process that was tough. Fact 3. Filming conditions were brutal. Director Denis Villeneuve was a huge fan of the book, and was insistent that the production team find locations that were worthy of an epic. That meant real challenging terrain in some of the most inhospitable places on Earth. For Caladan, they filmed on the Stadlandet Peninsula in Norway. The Liwa Oasis in the United Arab Emirates was used as part of the desert planet Arrakis, and there was also Jordan, but not everything went to plan there. We'll look into why in our next fact, which is now. Fact 4. An unorthodox tool was used to choose locations. The production designer of Dune, Patrice Vermette, must have been worried about his carbon footprint, because he used Google Earth to shortlist locations for scenes set on Arrakis. There were various inhospitable, harsh desert terrain shortlisted. Then he found his perfect location, the famous Wadi Rum Valley in Jordan, which has been used for many shoots including Lawrence of Arabia and John Wick 4, but there was just one issue. It didn't have any dunes. So the crew collected samples of sand from Jordan in water bottles so they could match its colour to an alternative location, and to the desert of Rabaul Kali in Abu Dhabi to save the day. Fact 5. The director refused to compromise on reality. We've already looked at how Villeneuve insisted on realism when it came to his locations, but he wanted this for as many aspects of Dune as possible, within reason. He didn't breed sandworms. So CGI was kept to a minimum. This meant building massive sets and props that the actors could interact with for real. One of these giant sets was based in Budapest, Hungary, for the indoor portions like the Emperor's Palace on Arrakis. Much of the Arrakeen invasion was also filmed here, in the back lot of Orgo Film Studios. Many of the explosions and views from the interior shot of the Ornithopsis needed a control space where the production team could build sets and physical effects. This is also where the huge number of extras in costumes were filmed for the invasion. The people of Hungary could be forgiven for thinking they were being invaded for real, although at least they didn't have the heat to worry about. Fact 6. The crew had a contingency to stop cameras melting. When shooting in Abu Dhabi, the heat really became a problem. Rebecca Ferguson has revealed that the crew had to be really careful when they got their shots because if they didn't, they'd lose a very key bit of equipment. Everyone needed to be ready for some early mornings because they could only shoot from 5.30 to 7 in the morning. If they didn't, the heat would become so intense that the cameras would melt. Fact 7. A vehicle was surprisingly made for real. To continue with the gruelling realism theme, VFX supervisor Paul Lambert has confirmed that the Thopters in June were made for real, using a combination of designs incorporating helicopters and dragonfly-inspired drawings. Although they didn't fly for real, the team painstakingly designed the models to give the illusion they could. The designs went from sketches to 3D models to full-scale models, where the actors could sit inside their cockpits and be moved by the effects crew in whatever way was necessary for the scene. There was one particular actor that made life very uncomfortable for whoever was in the cockpit at the time. We'll take a look at who later. Even though the team painstakingly constructed these shells for real, not everything could be made with the same level of practical consideration, but that doesn't mean the team didn't do everything they could to make the feeling of each scene look as authentic as possible. Fact 8. A massive construction effort was needed for the sandworm effect. The sandworms are a frightening prospect in the movie. The team had their work cut out when deciding just how to show the colossal effect these beasts had on the world around them. We'll look at the design of the sandworms themselves soon, but for the vibrations they caused to Earth, that VFX supervisor from earlier, Paul Lambert, 
Robert had a trick up his sleeve. He incorporated giant platforms on rigs placed in the middle of the desert. The sand was then placed on top of them and actors positioned themselves like they were in the dunes. When a sandworm was meant to pass beneath them, the platform would then rumble and shake. In this process, the actor's limbs would visibly start sinking into the earth. At least that's what it looked like anyway. Fact 9, the sandworms took a huge amount of time to design. The production designer we mentioned earlier, who had a thing for Google Earth, Patrice Vermette, had a huge part in designing the sandworms. He was tasked with looking at the biology of a potential creature according to Frank Herbert's source material. According to the director, the process involved a lot of thinking, a lot of dreaming, meditation, a lot of sketches, tons upon thousands of sketches and trying to find the right one. This would explain why it took a whole year to come up with the sandworms design. And then it was down to the effects team at DNEG to bring the disgusting creatures alive. And let's not forget Lambert's all-important platform from earlier. Fact 10. Chalamet's sandwalk needed a ballet choreographer. To evade the dreaded sandworms, Chalamet and his mum needed to walk like a native. Frank Herbert described this walk in the novel as step, drag, drag, step, step, wait, drag, step. To translate this to screen, Villeneuve called his friend, black swan choreographer and ex-husband of Natalie Portman, Benjamin Milpier, or Benjamin Millipede, no relation to a sandworm. For Chalamet, learning the sand walk was one of the most memorable parts of working on Dune. He committed to it and was determined to get it nailed so he could show Jessica the moves before their treacherous journey through the sand. Milpier wasn't the only expert with previous behind-the-scenes movie experience to help on this film. Fact 11. A Game of Thrones linguist worked on Dune. For the Fremen language, there was only one man who could come up with a dialect, and that was linguist David Peterson. He's most well known for creating the languages of Dothraki and Valerian for Game of Thrones. But his impressive resume doesn't stop there. He's also worked on languages for Thor, The Dark World, and Doctor Strange. The director has revealed that all the actors went to Fremen school. The Blade Runner 2049 filmmaker also said the actors took weeks to learn the language and came on set absolutely fluent. Fact 12, the costume department had their work cut out. Everyone behind you knew that making the movie was going to be far from an easy task, and this included costume designers Jacqueline West and Bob Morgan. Taking inspiration from Greek and Roman mythology and the dramatic tragedy that defines the novel, they needed to come up with over a thousand costumes for production, the kinds of numbers that would rival a cosplay convention. One of the most famous garments from the source material was the still suits that are designed to preserve the wearer's moisture. These needed to be made on a live cast of the actors. Although the process was very involved, it paid off as the actors' movements technically acted Activated the suits, which matched the brief for them to be as form-fitting as possible. The only downside was that they weren't exactly practical. Fact 13. There was a crucial difference in the still suits for men and women. The female cast members can be forgiven for feeling a little hard done by when it came to their costumes. We've already looked at how gruelling filming was in the intense heat of the desert. This meant the cast needed to take on board a lot of water. For the men in their still suits, they had the luxury of a slit for the actors to go to the toilet. However, the female version needed to be taken off fully for the same luxury. Unfortunately for them, Denis Villeneuve didn't stay so loyal to the book that they included a urine filtration system like in the novel, but maybe in future installments. Fact 14. Hawat's parasol came from health and safety concerns. The fetching prop that Stephen McKinley Henderson's character carries around seems to make sense in the movie to the point you don't question it, but the accessory was actually a bit of an accident. While the rest of the cast were reminiscing about life-changing experiences in the desert, Henderson was only due to film in Hungary, but even he couldn't escape the heat, as conditions were also crazy hot in Europe at the time. The makeup department gave him a parasol to protect him from the sun, but it was never meant for shooting. The director loved it and asked him to keep it in for the movie, and how fetching it is. Fact 15, a key member of the team had a difficult decision to make. One of the most influential men in Hollywood is usually hidden in a studio composing the mood for the movies. This is legendary composer Hans Zimmer, famed for his work on Gladiator, Inception and a million other different films. He's been a long-term collaborator as a composer with everyone's favourite mind-bending director Christopher Nolan, but June gave Zimmer a difficult decision to make. Nolan had already asked him to do the music for Tenet, but June was one of Zimmer's favourite books growing up. Eventually, nostalgia won through, and the German genius decided to pick Villeneuve over Nolan. Hopefully, it won't affect his career too negatively. Once he was on the project, Zimmer got to work and in trademark style started experimenting to get the sounds he wanted. Fact 16, the soundtrack features alien sounds. According to the composer, because he wanted to make the score sound like it was music from another planet, he was forced out of his comfort zone. This meant he ended up thinking outside the box, probably by using that box as an instrument. That's because he ended up inventing new ones for the score. 
He also developed his own language for the choral arrangements, making the score sound like it was incorporating music from another world. In fact, 17, the director took a massive risk while making June. When taking on his dream project, Villeneuve went back to the producers and insisted it had to be a two-parter because of the complexity of the book. They got back to him and agreed, but there was just one catch. They would only sign off on part one. This meant he had to throw himself into making the first half without having the green light for number two. This was a massive gamble, as he could have been known as the director who made Half of June. The good news for him was that the movie was a massive success, making $400 million worldwide. Not bad for a budget of $165 million. Needless to say, the studios were happy, and as we all know, part two got the go-ahead. Fact 18, someone was watching too much TV on set. With a lot of downtime on set in between learning a new language, you can forgive the actors for binge-watching some TV between takes. Jason Momoa had just seen the season 8 finale of Game of Thrones before rehearsing for a big fight scene as his character Duncan Idaho. This is why he decided to dedicate the scene to his former co-star in a behind-the-scenes video on his YouTube channel. Momoa had clearly been doing his groundwork before this scene, but there was another actor who admitted that he might have done more prep. Fact 19, one actor didn't do his homework before filming. The actors in the movie were all so keen to play their parts that casting was easy. Villeneuve made his wish list and pretty much got everyone he wanted. One of those names was Josh Brolin. When he was given the call, he said yes instantly because of the work he'd done previously with the director on Cicero. He signed up without even reading the script, but he pretended he had. Hopefully he did eventually read it, especially before his first day on set. Fact 20, one actor turned a vehicle into a Dutch oven. Sharon Duncan Brewster had the seemingly unfortunate role of sharing an ornithopter on set with Brolin. Unfortunate, because according to her, he used to fart a lot while shooting inside the vehicle. Then again, she didn't seem to mind. Although she couldn't pinpoint whether the gas was coming from the movement on set or his diet, she said it made her laugh. Rather you than me, Sharon.